Henry Norris Russell, a Princeton astronomer, had just gotten through a lecture when a lady came to him and asked him, if the universe is so big and our world is so small, can we really believe that there is a God that knows us and talks to us? His response was this, Madam, it depends on who your God is. Today, a voice in the mountain. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Bible study. Uh, we've been off for a couple weeks due to the Christmas holidays and New Year's, but we're back and we are ready to go. Today is going to be so, so good. I'm glad that you are watching. Thank you, those that are tuning in today live by Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Welcome this morning. And for those that may be watching later in the week, welcome into our Bible study this morning. I want to just say good morning to all the house folks here today that here we got kids in the background. We got our dog uh, doorkeeper there with his little sweater vest on. He's doing his job today. So we're going to jump right into this. And I got to ask you a question. Here it is. How does God speak to you? All those that are watching, how does God speak to you? Everybody in the house, how do we hear the voice of God? Do we hear God's voice through the Holy Spirit? Maybe that voice we hear during prayer time or while we're reading the Word of God. Do we hear God's voice by reading the Word of God? Yeah, we do. Do we hear God's wor uh, voice through dreams and visions? How many of y'all have ever had a dream or a vision from God? Does God speak to you that way? A lot of hands going up in the house. And another one, does God ever speak to you through His servants? Those that are authority over us. Does God speak to you in those ways? Well, we're going to be looking at some of these things. So what do you do when you cannot hear his voice because you become discouraged and uh, full of fear and you're despondent? Well, today we're going to take a look at Elijah. Again, the return of Elijah. You remember a couple weeks ago we talked about Elijah and he had two deserts, and right between those two desert times, sandwiched right in between those, was a mountaintop experience. And we're going to talk about that mountaintop experience today, and I have some really good things. So, uh, by the way, if you want to follow along, I think uh, Sarah's already put that graphic up, but we're going to look at it again. Here it is. If you'd like to follow along, you can have the notes go to our website, crosswalkchurchopflorida.com. Click on that resource tab, and you can find all the resources. And then there, you'll see valleys, deserts, and high places. Click on that, and it's yours to download, share, however you want, but it's there. So follow along with us today, and you'll see this. So today, we're going to start with 1 Kings 19. Now let's read verse 8 this morning. And this is what he says. 1 Kings 19, 8. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat, 40 days and 40 nights. Everybody say 40 days, 40 days. and 40 nights. 40. 40. Right, we're going to look at what that means in a moment. He went to uh, under Horeb, the mountain of God. So here's what's going on. Elijah has been resting. He uh, has been ministered to by angels. He's eaten once. But listen, he's still discouraged and despondent. Because God has not answered his prayers like he thought God should answer. Anybody else? Anybody watching today? Have you ever gotten to that place where you're waiting on God and you pray, you pray, you pray, and you get a little discouraged because no answer. It may be days, weeks, months. For some of you, even years, you're despondent. You're like, God, where are you? A little bit discouraged. You still believe that God can do it. Now, this is what I, I feel in the spirit today. Somebody's watching that is here in this place. This is your spiritual condition today. You're wondering where is. And I'm getting a light up here, Sarah. What does that mean? Does it blink all the time? Okay, it's up. Maybe we're okay. Um, open the back. Uh, I need that. It just caught my eye. I did not change batteries. And I uh, might be in the way here. We just got to keep our line of sight going. So here we go. So he's instructed to eat a second time, 
And uh, it, uh, the angels were telling him he's going to take a 170-mile hike to Mount Horeb from where he's at. And he's going to go with the strength of that for 40 days and 40 nights. Can you check that for me uh, on Facebook? Make sure we're okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to do a real good message here and then uh, people calling me going, hey, man, the sound went out. It did not change the batteries, and that may be what's going on. It did show, but it's blinking. I don't know why it's blinking. We're going to keep an eye on that. If y'all can keep monitoring, I would appreciate it. Let me just show you this. The number four in the Bible is the number of crackling. just crackling. Okay, uh, well, they're up in my office. So, but we'll, uh, I guess we can do this real quick. Yeah, there, Lisa knows where they are. She'll get them. Thank you, Sarah. I apologize if it's kind of going in and out. I'll, I'm going to stall a little bit so they can get the batteries and we can get this thing changed out. But you see it all over the Bible. We know that uh, Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and we know that other things are going on with 40. But the number 40 in the Bible means trials, probation, and testing. So what it means here is Elijah is in a time of a trial. He's in a time of testing. God is testing. How many of y'all are in that 40 days and 40 nights right now? It just feels like it. Uh, somebody say amen. Okay, y'all come on over here. That real quick. Uh, it won't take but just a second. I'm going to change these batteries out. Very, very quick. Let's see if that did any better. No, I don't know what's going on. We got we got a short somewhere or something. Uh, not sure what's going on. We're connected, okay? Well, we've been having a little trouble with our wireless headset, but it looks like it's good to go right now. It's solid. Okay, maybe we're good. I apologize. I hate when we had, how many of y'all know the devil gets in electronics? Yeah. <laughs> There's a demon of electronics, but we're going to go on. I'm glad you stayed with us if you did, because we're going to show you some really amazing things. It also parallels somebody else. Who else was in a mountain for 40 days and 40 nights? Anybody remember? Moses. And what mountain was he on? It's exactly right. This is the same mountain that Moses was on. It's the same mountain that Elijah finds himself. It's called the Mount of God. Uh, it's also uh, Sinai, Mount Sinai. So we know that he goes in the strength of this la the second meal that he receives while he's in the desert and commanded by the angels to go to the mountain of God. 175 miles. It takes him 40 days to go 175 miles. A trip that should have not taken any more than 10 took him 40. So there's a kind of a hint of maybe he was wandering around, didn't know exactly what he was supposed to be doing, whatever, whatever, whatever. How many of y'all know that when you're in the middle of a trial, sometimes you're not functioning right, and you're just kind of wandering around in your life? Somebody say amen. Yeah, we get despondent. We're going, ah, do I go? You wake up in the morning, oh, I'm going to go. And then by the evening time, you're like, oh, I don't think I'm going to quit. I'm not. And you get some rest, and you go on well, this is the story of Elijah. Remember, he is a mighty man of God. He is an awesome man of God. But let me show you what's going on in the story as I read these next few verses for you. Uh, verses 9 on down. Look at what it says. And he came thither unto a cave. Now, he's leaving the desert. He's wandered hundred and some odd miles. He comes to a cave, and he lodges there. He goes in, and he's going to take up camp there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What dost thou hear, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? Put your name there. What are you doing here, Sarah? What are you doing here? Whatever your name, fill in the blank. And it's going to make sense in a moment. Look at what it says. Verse 10. And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I alone, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. 
He was alone. He was discouraged. How many of y'all know a fiery trial can make you feel alone? It can isolate you. It's so important that you understand that if you're going through a fiery trial, that you are around other believers. The Bible says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. The reason is we need to encourage each other. We need to pray for one another. We need to be in that environment where God can minister to us. Am I say amen? amen? Let me go on. I'm looking at that light blinking and it's kind of making me crazy, but I'm good. Here we go. So God speaks to him and he says this. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Why have you come here? What do you want? More than that, what do you expect? So here he is. He's going to Mount Horb. He's climbed up the mountain. He's around the area. Some say this is the same uh, cave or cliff uh, that Moses went in when God passed him by. Very well could be. We have no reason not to believe that. So he's in this cave, and he hears the voice of God, and God says, What are you doing here? How many of y'all would love to wake up one morning and hear God go, what do you want? What are you doing here? Well, listen, this wasn't about the physical location. God could care less that he was in this mountain cave, but it had significance because it is the Mount of God. Elijah came, left the desert, goes to this mountain, a very specific mountain, and he will go back to the desert a different person. We need to have these mountaintop experiences so that we can have affirmation of who God is and what he needs us to do. Amen. I'm getting some amens. This is about the spiritual one. Elijah, what are you doing here spiritually? What brought you here? God is even even going to give Elijah the opportunity to voice his complaint. Now, look what it goes on. It says, he says this. God knows that Elijah is discouraged. How many of you know that God knows where you're at? He knows when you're discouraged. He knows when you're despondent. And uh, God knows Elijah is not only upset, he's about ready to quit. Those of you that are watching, are you, are you to the place? Have you been to the place where I just want to quit? Everything I do is not happening. There's no fruit. There's no results. Why am I doing this? Why do I need to keep on going? So Elijah's facing his complaint to God. He's really upset. He's ready to quit. And God allows him to speak his mind. I'm reading the book of Job right now. I read the Bible through every year, you know, chronologically, front to back, whatever. And right now I'm in Job. Job, God allows Job to vent. He vents to his friends. He vents about, where are you, God? If you would just show up face to face then we can work this out. I need to hear your voice. So it's a common theme throughout the Bible that God will allow us to go through these times so that he can do something. I'm going to show you what that is here in just a minute. Amazing as we connect some dots here. So Elijah is just justifying himself. We all do that. God, I've done this and I've done that. And, you know, when we're tired and we're wore out or we're discouraged, we tend to look at what we've done and the results that aren't there. And we really want God to do something. So have you ever been faithful to God, not seen substantial results? This is a good message for pastors out there that have worked and you work and you work and you sow. And you still don't feel like you're getting anywhere. Listen, I could write the book on that. (laughs) I'm telling you, I know what it is. It could be for anybody. You've been called and you're working for God. You've been praying for a loved one, whatever. And boy, you've been praying and fasting and pouring your life into that and no results yet that you see. Doesn't mean that God's going to sleep. You just can't see what God's doing. I'll show you something cool here in just a second. So here it is. Let me show you a couple of verses just to kind of help you out a little bit here. Just two real simple ones. Matthew 6, Jesus is talking. And it's in the middle of a verse. and It says, your heavenly father know that you need. God in heaven knows what you need. Come on. God knows what we need. Look at Ephesians 3.20. This one really, really, you need to wrap your mind around this one because this is a very good verse. Ephesians 3.20. 
Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or what? Think. Thinking is not asking. It's, it's kind of brewing in your mind, in your heart, and God knows it. So God knows what you want. He knows the desires that you have in your heart. It says, according to the power that worketh in us. So I want you to understand right now, God does know. Why hasn't God done it the way you want to do it yet? Because God's not going to do it your way. God has a timing. God has a way that he does things. He's going to show Elijah something really cool here. Now, let me read a lot of verses for you here today and uh, bring this into something. I want you to see it. Look at 1 Kings 11 through 15. It's part of 15. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now look at this verse. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Everybody say that. Still. Very good. Watch about the still, small voice here in a moment. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What dost thou hear, Elijah? Once again, God says the same thing. Good morning, Juan. He says the same thing. What are you doing? Why are you here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. And he goes on, he's going to begin to explain and complain. Anybody ever done that? Explain and complain? Yeah, we all do it. He says, Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, there he goes again, I'm the only one left, poor me. He says, I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return, to, uh, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. Now, you got to remember, he starts out in one desert. He goes to the top. And we've talked about both of the deserts. But he's in the mountain now. And there's a reason. Now, let me give you some good, good teaching. Are y'all ready for this? And if, if you want these notes, you need to go online and get them because they are going to be so good. Now, here's what we need to see. The first thing God is showing. Now, one of the things I, I kind of had to pray about a lot, it says that there was a, a great wind. And there was this earthquake that shook everything in this fire. But it said that God was not in those. And this is what it means. It means that God wasn't going to speak to Elijah through those things. He was showing how strong and the kind of might and power that he had. He's going to speak to Elijah in a different way. Now, let me just go to here. Let me just show you. The first thing you see here is that God is God's vitality, his energy, his being. What is God all about? So God humbles everybody say humbles he humbles elijah through demonstration now if we were on that mountain with elijah now when we get to uh eternity and uh, there's a teaching out there that pastor mark Carell does about the carousel of time amazing teaching that we might can go back and view some things that have happened wouldn't you love to go back and view elijah standing at that cave in this wind blowing in this earthquake shaking there's so many things i would like to do so he does that. Listen, there's a violent wind and an earthquake and fire. Now, let me just tell you what this represents. It represents the Trinity. Wind is like the Father. You can feel him, but you can't see him. Earthquake is Jesus coming to earth, and he shakes heaven and earth. He shakes hell as he takes on the form of man in the earth. Fire? Well, what does the fire represent? Anyone? Anyone? Everyone? Yeah. The Holy Spirit. So God is manifesting the whole Trinity in front of Elijah while he's alone, while he's despondent. Listen, God wants to show himself to us, not only when we're in a fiery trial, but every day of our lives. God wants to show us something. But in this situation, God is using something that's 
manifest him with great intensity as he gets Elijah's attention. Listen, if we've ever been in the presence of God where he shook you to the core, it will shake all the doubt out of you. It will shake all the fear out of you. It will shake all the unbelief out of you. That's why we have services where we come in, we have worship where God moves and we feel the power of God. Listen, I felt the mighty wind in revival services. I've seen God fill a room with smoke. Come on, we've all seen that. It's God demonstrating His power to us so that we can believe, listen, there's something out there bigger than us. We are not alone. Say that, I am not alone. Somebody needs to hear this out there today. You are not alone. God gives us these Bible stories to show us and reaffirm in us. So you don't believe me yet. Well, let me show you some things. Let me show you how God spoke in the Bible. Y'all ready? This is some good note-taking here. Job. In Job 38, 1, it says this. The Lord answered Job out of the what? The whirlwind. A tornado comes sweeping past him. And the voice, how many of y'all would fall on your face and be humbled really quick if a tornado came tearing through your backyard, and you fall on your face and go, God is God. I heard his voice. He, he's there. How many of you do that? Here's the whirlwind again. Okay? And I'm not done. Boy, it's going to get really good as we go. Look at this. How about the Israelites on Mount Sinai, the very place that Elijah is right now in Exodus 20, verses 18 through 19? Look what it says. And all, I say all. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mount smoking. And the people saw it. They removed and stood afar off. They ran. I would too. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But don't let God speak, or else we will die. Come on. God spoke in the mountain and there was wind and fire, and, all, and the people ran and hid in their tents. They went, Moses, we can't handle this. We can't handle God's presence. You want some more? Let me give you some more. How about Ezekiel? Ezekiel 1, 3, and 4. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chebar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind. She's a tornado. I love this verse right here. A whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, a fire enfolding itself. Now, can you imagine some special effects right now? These tornadoes and this big, big, giant uh, cloud is coming and it's rolling and this fire is just rolling inside of itself. It will make you fall on your face. And it says, and the brightness was about it. And all in the midst thereof is the color of amber and out of the midst of the fire. So in God's presence, there's fire. There's thundering. There's smoke. There's all these things. Listen, we think that we're just going to die and sit on a cloud somewhere with sound nowhere and playing some. Listen, you better get ready for a spectacular thing in God's presence. We're going to see things we've never seen before. Things that we can't even hardly understand. As John the Revelator and Ezekiel and Isaiah saw all these things, we're going to get to see these things. God's demonstrating something here. Come on, let me go on. How about this one? John the Revelator has talked about it. In chapter 4, verse 1, is a change. The first three chapters in the book of Revelation talk about the church age. There's a change as chapter 4 starts. He looks up and he looks to the heavens. It says the heavens open. That means the church is no longer here. It's about the rapture. And John sees something. He says, Out of the throne proceeded what? Lightnings and thunders and voices. And there were seven lamps of what? Fire burning. That's seven spirits. These were before him, the throne, and they were the seven spirits of God. So we're beginning to see something here that in God's presence, there's going to be a manifestation but we don't always see that in our life and i'll tell you about that here in the next one now look at this one the day of pentecost watch acts 2 1 through 4 and when the day of pentecost was fully come 50 days after uh jesus resurrected they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a what sound from heaven as of a what 
There's that mighty wind blowing again. There's a song we used to sing, The Wind is Blowing Again. You used to always sing that thinking, man, revival. When we feel that wind blow, we, and there's a lot I'm not going to go into, but let me finish up with this says. It says, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. This is a Bible doctrine that we don't need to toss out because of some kind of uh, theological teaching. Maybe our church believes, oh, that's not of God. And we've been taught our life. Listen, read the Word. Come on. There's nowhere in the Word that says that the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit have with the first century church. In fact, I do a sermon, and I need to do it again sometime, that shows through every century since the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where there's been speaking in tongues and power of the Holy Spirit and manifestations of the gifts of God throughout history. There, you just got to find it. But let me show you something else here. It, and it says, And began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them other. And also, look at Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place was what? Shaken. We're seeing all the very three signs that uh, Elijah saw. We're seeing them happen. Go on. And they were assembled together and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, if you want some more verses, you can check it out because it's not isolated to just these two chapters in Acts. In fact, Acts 8, Acts 11, Acts 16, uh, 19, I'm sorry. All of these have an account of the Holy Spirit. And one of them says, as it did on the day of Pentecost. So we know there was a repetition. By the way, only was it poured out on the uh, Jews. But one of these verses talks about it's poured out on Gentiles. Why? Because they needed boldness to preach the Word of God. They needed boldness to move. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit for what they were about to do. Listen, if you think they needed it back then, you better buckle up your belt because we need it today. Because in the end times, the devil is going to raise his head. There's going to be things going on. You need the power of God's Holy Spirit. In fact, if you will just get the power of God's Spirit in here, you would be uh, you would stop being like a wave that's tossed about like the wind. You would be uh, stable in understanding what God needs to do in your life. Amen. Woo! Can I get a witness today? I told you it was going to be good. This is God's vitality. So God's purpose was to redirect Elijah's focus and to humble his heart. Because Elijah had gotten to the place where he didn't think God could do it. Somebody say amen. How many of you are there? Maybe you're watching. You feel like, I don't know if God wants to do this for me. I don't know if God is willing. I know nothing's impossible, but I don't know if he's going to do it. Listen, you need to understand the promises of God. He's sending you to a place where your heart has humbled. Now, here's the problem in church today. Have we become too accustomed to God in our churches? God is just word just a phrase a catchphrase yeah oh god i love god i'm a, you know got to, i'm born again back in the 70s and 80s it was we're born again like the bullfrogs and butterflies now it's like yeah y'all remember that some of y'all are old i'm glad i'm not as old as you <laughs> let me go on. you know and now it's like yeah you know uh, uh i know god god's love everything's about god's love god's love yeah god is love but there's some other things about god that we can't miss We've become too accustomed to him. You know, God just accepts us like we are, and we can live like we want. How many of y'all know it's not how it works? Not at all. We've forgotten how awesome and how holy God is. Because when we holiness and how we should be reflecting that holiness, we wouldn't be doing some of the things that we do. We would be seeking God to forgive us and the Holy Spirit to help us overcome these bondages in our lives. And you can do it. Somebody say, amen. We forgot what it means to uh, reverence God and to fear God. Look at every movie out there. Every movie. It used to be just R-rated movies. They would use God's name in vain. Now it's all over. Can't even watch a G movie without somebody using God's name or Jesus' name in vain. Listen, have you ever noticed nobody ever says Satan's name in vain? Have you? No. No. It's all about, that ought to tell you something right there. 
Here's, what, here's what's going on. Elijah had forgotten, and God was going to remind him. Let me just show you a couple verses here. Look at Deuteronomy 4.24. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. God does not want to share you with the world. He does not want your uh, allegiance to half the time to the world, part of the time to him, and you're back and forth. Listen, he's a consuming fire. He's going to consume evil as days. Psalm 50, verse 3. May our God come and not keep silent. Fire devours before him, and he is very tempestuous around us. Tempestuous around us. Look what it says. God is working. We just don't see it today. He is working. He is doing some great things. Uh, let me go on. So people don't fear and reverence God in our churches today for one simple reason. He's not there. What? He's not there. When you kick the Holy Spirit out of your services, when you kick the Holy Spirit out of what you believe, you're removing the presence of God. When you're setting up men over God because they're popular and they have all these great motivational things to say, we're not giving God the glory due to God. Somebody say amen. When we put music and the style and the song and all those above what worship is really all about, we're not worshiping God. It's a focus. God uses those things to focus us back on Him. So we have godless churches, spiritless meetings, oculus uh, services. Listen, this scripture account is a reminder of who God is and what He's capable of. Now let me give you a second thing today. Real quick, God's voice. Let me show you God's voice. After all these things happen, Rocks are splitting, fires blowing all over the place, tornadoes are all over the place, and it just stops. God speaks. Oh, I like this. God speaks to Elijah, it says, in a still, small voice. Elijah wasn't ready to hear it until God put him on his face. So you're not ready to hear what God has to say until he humbles you and puts you on your face. Come on, somebody say amen. Once we're humbled and still and focused, that's when God speaks to our hearts. Because we're so busy, we hear the rumblings of the world around us and our trials and the devil sitting on our shoulder going, you can't do it, nothing's ever going to change, God has given up on you, he's not going to do it for you. When you get all of that out of your mind and begin to say, I believe in God. You need to go back and hear my sermon. Boy, it just blew up on uh, Facebook. People were listening to it all and going, man, this is really good. We need to understand the importance of a day. And I preached that last week. But what we need to understand right now, look at these two words, still and small. This is what the Greek means. Still means, or the Hebrew, still means calm. God comes in peace and calm and calms us. Our minds aren't frantic over the bills. Our minds aren't frantic over what we're facing. Our minds are frantic over having to replace this and replace that. I'm in one of those weird weeks where nothing's working. And I'm a person that likes to fix things. And if I can't fix it, it drives me crazy. Well, God knows that. <laughs> He's working that through me right now. It's that still calming God. I'm going to calm down and I'm going to let you do. Listen, there's some things I can't fix. I got to let God fix it. I got to take my hands off. You got to take your hands off of some of those things. You keep trying to manipulate and organize it and scrutinize it and perfectionize it. It's a new word. Armand Dictionary. But look at this word small. It means crushed. What did the wind do? It crushed rocks. What did the wind do in the upper room? It crushed everybody to a place where they could receive the power of God. Crushing is that time where God comes and he presses the world out of us. It's that time when his power comes and, we, and it manifests in us and we begin to really understand. Listen, it's about the Shekinah glory of God 
coming on you and reaffirming in you what God is capable of doing. And when we humble ourselves and quit arguing with God and saying and giving him all these justifications of why we do and what we do, then you need to understand that's when the still small voice comes to us. And I'm going to give you some verses. Here we go. Psalm 4610. Be still. Everybody say still. And no, what does that mean? It means get your mind off the problems and get your mind on God. Know what he's capable of doing. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathens. I will be exalted in the earth. He wants to be exalted over your situation. Somebody just say, thank you, Lord. I'll let you. Habakkuk 2.20 says this, the Lord is in his holy temple, all the earth. Be quiet in his presence. Steal your mind. What are you doing here, Elijah? Steal your mind. Make your mind steal. Get your mind off of those things you can't control. And let me be the God over it. Let me speak to you in that still, small voice. Listen, the only time you're going to hear the still, small voice is when you stop and you slow down, and you put your mind out of gear and quit trying to fix things yourself and quit trying to logically get through this thing and using your resources that you don't have enough of and just stop and let the Spirit speak to you. Let the Spirit come over you. Slow down enough. Listen, some of y'all don't slow down enough to uh, even feel God had um, <clears throat> a Baptist friend there in Birmingham. We... Uh, I had some good friends in different churches, and uh, he goes, man, y'all sure have some good music in your church. Too bad all you Holy Ghost people are running around so fast you can't hear God. He had a point. <laughs> kind of. It was a joke, and I took it with a grain of salt. Yeah, I said, yeah, but man, it feels good to have the fire. You know, it's one of them things. Being still and knowing God. Let me go on. Zechariah 2.13. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. In other words, God has got up, gotten up. He has rolled up his sleeves, like that song said, that um, Toby Mac song. He's rolling up his sleeves. And man, he's getting ready to do something in your life. Come on, somebody say amen. Here we go. Let me show you this. Oh, come on now. There we go. God's vitality, his energy. His power, his violent almost nature, not like we see it as a terrible thing. He will crush or humble you, but you still uh, humble you, but his still small voice will calm you. How many of y'all need calming out there? How many of y'all need calming in that? We all need calming. Listen, the world gets crazy, things get, and it's not going to get any easier because the spirit of the Antichrist is rising up all over the world. You just need to watch the news. I'm not going to get into that. But we need to understand the Bible says perilous times are coming. Are you ready? Are you ready to embrace the things of God so that God's Holy Spirit can come on you and let that still small voice that's going to calm you. But listen, some of you need to understand this. He may allow some things to go, to go on. He may have to violently come in. Remember what the word says. The kingdom of heaven suffereth what? Violence. And the violent, what does that mean? It means that you allow the spirit to come in and change you. Violently change you. I've seen the movies where somebody freaks out. Oh, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. And the hero walks over and what does he do? <laughs> Some of y'all got a little bit too into that one. Pow! He slaps her across the face and they go, <gasps> and they start crying because they were in I think sometimes we need to slap us. We need the Holy Spirit just to knock back into reality and go, listen, I was in charge from the moment of Genesis 1 where it says, in the beginning, God. And I will be all the way to the end in Revelation where it says, amen. 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 Well, Thank you for joining us today. Uh, next week, we're going to get into a really, it may be the last week. God may do some stuff. We're going to look at some end time thing. Daniel, about a mountain and a rock. It's going to be amazing. I pray that you would join us next week. Until then, God bless you and have a great week.